بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم اینڈ ویلکم ٹو ڈپلومیٹک ان کلیو آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ ما خالد بٹ ایز یو نو وی انٹرویو امبیسڈرز ہیڈز آف آرگنائزیشنز اینڈ ڈفرینٹ ایمیننٹ پرسنالٹیز ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ دا ورک دے آر ڈوئنگ ایز ویل ایز دا کوآپریشن ود پاکستان بٹ سم ٹائمز وی گیٹ دا پریولیج آف انٹرویوئنگ پیپل اینڈ پرسنالٹیز ہو آر ہیڈنگ ایکسٹریملی امپورٹنٹ آرگنائزیشنز دا ورلڈ اوور ان آر میکنگ اے چینج فار دا ورلڈ دس ٹائم وی ہیو اے لیڈی a lady who is from South Africa, a lady who's been the deputy president of that country and now since 2013 is heading a very important organization that is the United Nations Women. She's striving to make a change for the women and girls around the world, including Pakistan. And we have the privilege of having her in this exclusive, in this very episode of Diplomatic Enclave. Her name is uh, Fumzile Mlambo Tnuka. Let me introduce to you the excellency, the beautiful woman, and the woman who's been working to make a change since the last five years, the world over, for women and girls. Excellency, thank you very much to have joined us. Thank you very much for having me. First of all, ma'am, let me tell you, I'm a fan. Uh, a fan in the sense of the huge body of work that you've done for women and girls around the world. Was it always your intention to work for such a cause? In some ways, uh, I started early as a teenager. I was part of YWCA and a young Christian women's organization, which means that uh, it's a world organization. I had uh, an opportunity to interact with young people uh, who were fighting for gender equality as girls and uh, I had mentors at a very young age. From there onwards, it was only going to be uh, an issue that will always be present in my life, including women from Pakistan who were part of the YWCA, mentored me as a young woman because they used to come to international meetings and through them, I was able to see how important it is to stand for gender equality. You've been a teacher. You began your career being a teacher and you're also the founder of a foundation that's called the Um Lambo Foundation that supports leadership and education. Did that also help you while you were working with women and girls around the world? Well, this came a bit later in my life, but uh, being a school teacher, noticing the challenges that girls faced as young students was what motivated uh, me, was what taught me because in a way, young people can mentor us uh, by the way they fight against adversaries, but also they can expose you to the challenges um, uh, that, uh, that, that they face. But living in South Africa under apartheid as well, there were many laws under apartheid that were harsh to black people and harsher to women. And that on its own was a motivating factor. You were a member of parliament of uh, South Africa's first democratic government from 1994 to 96. You followed that up by being the minister of uh, minerals and energy from 95 uh, to uh, 99 to 2005. And also the minister in the department of trade and industry from 96 to 99. Uh, very important positions in the government as well. Uh, but at the same time, that little zest to work for uh, women also remained. Did on, you on the sidelines continue to work for women as well while you were working in the political arena? My enter into the political arena was via the women's struggles because women in South Africa fought just as hard for the liberation of South Africa. Women wanted to make sure that they were adequately reflected in the new South Africa that they fought for. And fortunately for us, our first president, Nelson Mandela, was a feminist. He wanted to be sure that women were represented adequately in government and that women's issues were reflected uh, in the laws that we were passing. He actually used to say, no nation can ever be free until the women are fully emancipated. And that was a platform for us to be, to be activists what a as well. What absolutely, a absolutely. He was such a fantastic mentor. And to sit in his cabinet and to have him as my boss uh, was a teaching experience every day when you sat with him in cabinet and outside cabinet. That must be a wonderful and exciting and unique experience. 
And uh, uh, going on from 2005 to 8, you were the deputy president of South Africa. You oversaw programs related to combating poverty and, of course, a growing economy for the poor and with a particular focus on women. How much of a success did you feel you managed to achieve during that time period? Well, I cannot talk about complete success because even up to today, we're still fighting uh, to end poverty in South Africa. The whole world is still fighting to end poverty, which uh, affects girls more than anyone, girls and women more than anyone else. Uh, what I have learned throughout my experience is that if you target your interventions for poverty and other ills in society towards women, they are likely to benefit everybody else. If you have limited resources and you don't know, not know where to start in order to address issues such as inequality, close your eyes and focus on women. Once you focus on women, you've, you will benefit men. Everything just falls into place because the women are at the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Once you address the bottom of the pyramid, everyone that is above the pyramid gets to benefit. So if you want to err on the side of caution, always focus on girls, always focus on women. Through that process, you will be able to bring about a better society for everybody. Because as they say, you educate a woman, you educate a nation. The best way to educate a nation, start with your women. Or focus on your women, but also never exclude men and boys. That is, of course, a very important point to make. But how many of the men, when you were telling that during your stint in the government, and also when you began in the United Nations, understood your point of view. Did you feel that there was a lot of patriarchy in different governments, in different societies across the world? There is a lot of patriarchy up to today, period. Mm -hmm. There just isn't enough men on the side of gender equality, but there's an increasing number of men who are seeing the light, who are doing a, a important work. We need more men to do that work. And the men who are doing that work, they need to be visible. Again, I'll go back to quote my hero, Nelson Mandela. He said, when good men do not do enough to stand for gender equality, that is a conspiracy against women. So we don't want good men to be in a, in a conspiracy. We want them to walk the talk and to be in front because some of the greatest impact that advances gender equality is driven by men looking at other men doing the good things, even more than me doing something, because I'm the usual suspect. People expect me to make these points, to take on these issues. But when Omar does it, it's even more fantastic. <laughs> That's so great. And I hope I can imbibe a little bit of the energy, the zeal, and the zest that you have, Excellency. That would be a privilege for a person like myself. You joined the uh, United Nations uh, UN Women in 2013, on the 19th of August, to be precise. What was your vision? when you uh, were accepted in UN Women? Actually, it was an overwhelming privilege uh, to have to be part of, firstly, such an august institution. You know, as they say, the best thing you can get in a job is working for an organization uh, that you are proud of, to work for a boss that you respect, to do a job that you are excited to do. If you get all of these three, that's a job made in heaven. I had that starting to work with women, which doesn't mean it's not difficult. It has been difficult because the issues are so overwhelming. But what I have found was the importance of learning to work with others. That I had a motivating, motivated team within UN Women, but only by ourselves, we cannot address the issues. I have learned in working with UN Women and working on gender equality that you actually need everybody. As a result, in my own work, I have gone out of my way to work with men and boys, to work with religious leaders, to work with traditional leaders, to work with private sector, to work with young people. Because as you can imagine, gender inequality is in all these spaces and each one of these constituencies are critical for us to change and to succeed. So it's been overwhelming to not only uh, face the challenges, but very inspiring to actually reach out and find allies in all these other spaces, but we need more. So everyone who's listening to you today, be an ally. Wherever you are, make a move. No move is too small. 
everybody can make a difference. In the case of Pakistan, let us all stand against child marriage because those girls will change the world if we give them an opportunity to stay at school and they finish. These are our doctors, these are our nurses, these are our lawyers, these are our captains of industry. But if they marry early, we kill the dream. We absolutely, absolutely kill the dream. There is nothing in this world than a little child. There is nothing as inspiring as a little girl with a whole future in front of her. We must not take it away from them. That is so true, Excellency. When you came to Pakistan, when you were told you were to visit Pakistan, what was your perception as the Executive Director of UN Women of a country like Pakistan? I so much wanted to come to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. It's my first visit, so I didn't have to be asked. I was the one who wanted to come, so I'm glad that I'm here. And of course, uh, uh, congratulations to the people of Pakistan for the elections that you have had, for the space that you've created for yourself to continue uh, with uh, building, uh, building the country. I've been so moved to hear about the number of initiatives that government is undertaking. We just finished a discussion now with the work that the government is doing to address the issue of, uh, of disability and a differently abled person and what the uh, government is doing to address the issue of women who are part of that community, but also even more inspiring to see the women themselves in their wheelchairs, speaking for themselves and being very articulate about their needs. I have learned a lot just in these hours that I've been in Pakistan about the issues of disability. I have been to Miti, I've met women in a community and I've heard about the fights of the traditional leaders, of the religious leaders, of the women themselves, of ordinary people in that community who are fighting to end uh, child marriage. I've had an opportunity with business. I've had a discussion about how can business in Pakistan advance the sustainable development goals and how can business play a role in increasing female labor participation in the Pakistani economy. Because I guarantee you, the more women you have in this economy, the more booming the economy will become. It is an important missing link. The low ranking that Pakistan has got in the indexes of gender equality will shoot up very high if more women went into the labor market. Let's make it happen, Omar. All what right. do you I, say? I, I am all for you and I would love to help you out and you and women out whenever the opportunity arises because I for one am a feminist as well and I say that on the camera. Speaking of sustainable development goals, gender equality is a standalone goal in the SDGs. You visited a lot of countries in the world. Uh, how important uh, do you feel is gender equality, is women's rights as part of the SDG, and how much has uh, this part of the SDG been implemented in different countries of the world that you have visited? Yeah. You know, gender equality is a precondition. Gender equality is a precondition for the success of SDGs. If we do not advance in gender equality, the SDGs will not have the benefits that they were meant to have. So it is important for everyone who is focusing on SDGs to have that as a priority. So that's an important uh, uh, factor to, 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 to underline. In terms of the implementation of the SDGs, so far, the biggest challenge that we see is, in fact, let me start by the positive and say there's lots of efforts to, uh, uh, to implement SDGs. Governments are trying, communities are trying, private sector is, 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 is trying all over the world, but the initiatives are small mm. compared to the size of the problems that need to be uh, addressed and slow. Mm. So acceleration and scale are the two biggest challenges facing the SDGs. Certainly, to the extent that the SDGs should benefit women, we will not reach the kind of ambition that we have, not unless we accelerate the pace and we scale up. And we can achieve that by identifying the initiatives that are making a difference and then scale them up, replicate them as quickly as possible. Because then once we know that something works, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. And pace is important, which means that we have to invest much better and much more in gender equality. Because the reason why things move a bit slow is because there's no resources. People start something that is uh, good, 
then they run out of resources. Then they have to take time looking for resources or it is underfunded and therefore they are unable to do the work uh, to the extent that it needs to be done. We know the answers, there are lots of good answers. People have experimented, they've got all kinds of laboratories to address the issues that the SDGs are about. Now let's just get it all out there. It's not the absence of answers that is the problem now. It's a stronger political will, decisiveness and the scaling up that is required. When you talk of stronger political will, how do you feel when you go to countries and talk to heads of states? Is uh, their reaction when you make them understand the importance of gender parity, the importance of the role of women in society and the importance of public-private partnership? Well, uh, it's very difficult for any leader to say I am not for gender equality. So I think most leaders say the right thing. They don't necessarily do the right thing. Mm. I would like in every country, for instance, to see gender equal cabinets. That would be such a positive uh, move. Right now in the world, there's only 10 countries with gender equal cabinets. Ooh. And that is something that is much easier to do because it takes just a decision of one person to actually uh, make th th that decision. The representation of women in parliament in around the world is not even 25%. The global average is still 23%. This is the responsibility of political parties who must make sure that when they campaign and say we are here, we stand for the people, which is what politics is about. The people are not men only. They must make sure that when they campaign, they actually make sure that the women in their own political party are strategically placed in the lists that uh, are, are they put forward for election in that way increase the chance of women uh, because democracy that is predominantly patriarchal that's not democracy that is so true you know so democracy still has to be found mm. in the world there's very few countries where we have gone uh, as far as that the issue of violence against women that is so important there just isn't enough zero tolerance in the world for violence against Even women. Even in developed countries, ma'am. Absolutely. There isn't a single country that has uh, grappled successfully with this issue of violence against women. So every country has to do something on this issue of violence against women. The police and all of law enforcement in every country has a significant role to play in order to address violence against women so that when women go out to report, they will be believed, they will be treated fairly, prosecution will be effective and there will be accountability to the perpetrators. As long as the perpetrators do not see that you are accountable for your misbehavior, they have no incentive uh, to change. And we have to stop this thing of saying, because of the Me Too movement, men are suffering. Mm -hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. There are more than a billion women in the world that live with violence. You have a handful of women, of men, who have been called to book to pay for what they are around doing. Already with this handful versus a, a, a billion women, we are saying that men have a crisis. The majority of women don't even report because of the shaming and the stigma that they suffer. Those who report do not get as much justice as they deserve. But now we have to be concerned about how we uh, do not make this uncomfortable to men. I just think that this is now another oppression of women, but also we want due process. Men must not be accused falsely. We also want to make sure that we do not create a situation where we discredit genuine complaints by the, 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 the women who may, or men who may accuse uh, falsely. But from where I am sitting, the, the number of false accusation versus the amazing data that we have about genuine cases should not confuse the situation. It is an injustice that is being done to women with genuine women who are dying. You know how we know that violence against women is highly prevalent? Because we do our research with health providers. Most of the time it is the emergency room and it is the health workers with the mental and psychiatric problems that women face. 
it is the uh, orthopedic surgeon because of the surgeries they have to do. It is the eye specialist because of the women whose eyes are burning. It is the ear specialist because of women. It is the broken noses. That we, it is the morgues because of the dead bodies of the women that we see. That is the evidence of the scale of violence against women. And I want us not to trivialize this by pretending that the few women and incidences where there's false reporting must erase this big sketch of violence. When men begin to talk about this being unfair to them, you almost feel, what are they defending? If you have nothing to fear, and you're doing the right, the, 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 the right thing, you don't have to fear that you're going to be accused falsely because you don't do anything wrong. Men are our brothers, they are our uncles, they are our partners, they are our colleagues. We actually want to stand together because what we want what's fair for them and what's fair for women. Mm, they're also our fathers and our sons. Absolutely. And they are the ones who will teach their wives, the other men, their boys as well, how to treat Absolutely. their sisters, how yeah. to treat their mothers so that they can bring on the change in the new generation. When you talk about change, when you talk of incentives, Excellency, uh, how can we not talk about the Me Too movement, the recently started Hear Me Too mm. movement and the 16 days of activism? Would you highlight the importance of these movements and if change has been brought about you to these? Yeah. Well, uh, Hashtag Me Too has been very good for highlighting the prevalence of violence against women. Through Me Too, we have been able to see how it is possible for one person to be a serial abuser, get away with it, even retire with honors, leaving a trail of broken uh, hearts because of the suffering that people have had to endure quietly. Sometimes with the knowledge of the colleagues in the same workspace, but because violence against women and sexual harassment becomes normalized, the people who should be complaining and defending the victim also keep uh, quiet. What Me Too has done is to say, this is not okay. The increase of women who sit in the boardrooms uh, of institutions and companies have also made it possible to have the reports of, of uh, any misdoing by senior people uh, that gets reported in board that could be swept up under carpet, not to be swept under carpet. So to have more women in positions of authority has been very good for believing women and making it possible for the perpetrators to be called for accountability. So Me Too has been very good. Me Too has been also been very good in its use of social media to make sure that we create a, a critical mass of voices that can speak together. Me Too has also been very good as a solidarity platform where women who felt that they were alone, there's many women who suffered violence, including the founder of Me Too, who said at the time when she suffered this violence, she thought she was the only one in the world who was suffering this until she read a book by Maya Angelou where she was talking about her own abuse. And then she said, my goodness, this thing happens to many women. She started to feel I should be in solidarity with other women so that they will not feel as lonely as I felt when I didn't know other people who were suffering because everybody was silent. That is how she said, me too, to the other women. Me too is a form of therapy that enables women to feel comfortable to talk to someone who they feel understand their pain. It is one of the ways in which uh, uh, you provide uh, the therapy from the perspective of, of a person who has walked in your own shoes. It is about sisterhood and it is about solidarity. But Hear Me Too is a tribute to this first step that Me Too started. What it says is, say, for those of us who have not had the courage or the possibility to stand up and to speak for themselves, we want you to hear me too. We, I am a woman, I am in a, I am in a home, I, I, divide, I, I depend on the uh, person who is abusing me. I'm afraid to talk, but hear me too. I do something. I am a school child. I am abused by my teacher or by my, uh, by my, my schoolmates. Please hear me too. I'm afraid of the stigma if I come out. I am a woman who is working in a factory. My supervisor in my, in my unit 
abuses me, if I say something, I'm going to lose my job, but I am suffering, I'm in pain, hear me too. So that you, Omar, and myself, are the person that this hear me too is talking to, so that we can be the people who are making the voices of these women much louder. What about the 16 days of activism, ma'am? The 16 days of activism is a period, an intense period every year, where we shine a light on the issue of violence against women. Not that 365 days uh, uh, we should be quiet. We should be talking about it every day until we have conquered. But the 16 days is when we get the whole world to focus. We have an orange color during the 16 days in order to make sure that uh, during this time we are in the same conversation. And the reason why we have a theme every year, like this year we have Hear Me Too, it is because we want to synchronize our conversation. We try and have a theme that everybody can relate to. So it is a mobilization moment. It is an energizing moment. It also is a time when some women who are hesitant either to be active or to talk about their violence find their courage because they can hear this noise all over and then they find their own courage to stand up and to let their stories uh, uh, be heard. When you talk of women's stories being heard, violence, aggression against women, harassment of women, whether on the street, on the work, in class, at home, is something that a lot of women have taken for granted as their norm. Why has that been so over the generations, over the so many decades that the women around the world have not risen up uh, to the fact that this is not a normal attitude. Because the status quo uh, has uh, not been in any way averse to the, to, to the issue, uh, it has created a situation where gender inequality and violence against women is seen as a given. When women do report and complain about uh, violence against them and the reaction to them uh, is stigmatization and victimization. It gives an impression that the women are disturbing the peace. What has happened to them is normal. Live with it. One way of making sure that we change this normalization is react appropriately. Take correctional action. Uh, deal with the perpetrator without fear and favor. In that way, we are telling the younger men you are telling the other perpetrator that this is okay. You are going to get in tr to trouble if you do this. But if there is no reaction, it is business as usual, then we actually normalize this. When mothers, uh, stepmothers, uh, sisters in a family observe violence and ill treatment of another member of the family and they do not take action, they keep it as a family secret. They are actually normalizing this. They are affirming the perpetrator. So speaking out is not shaming your family, is not shaming your colleague. It is about helping society to move on in the right direction. So we need your voices and all of us need to find a way of supporting those who have taken the big step to come forward and to tell their stories. Mm. This is a very important point that you've taken. It's very important to come forward and tell your stories and that the men need to understand that a lot of things that they have been doing in the past has been wrong. That respect to women, understanding women, and giving the women their rights is as important as women giving men Absolutely. their rights. Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way. Mm. It's a two-way process. Uh, uh, gender equality is gender equality. The equality of both that men's, the respect of the respect of rights of both men and women. Women do not want more than their fair share in society. They just want what is necessary and equal and rightfully theirs. They want to make sure that men also get what is rightfully theirs. That is why when many women make it in life, when they have better resources, they take care of their families, men and women, because they recognize that their success must not just be their success. It must be the success of their family, of their children, women and men, old people in the family. Women recognize that equality is a necessary condition for societies to prosper. And this is the way we should, we should speak about this issue. Gender equality, gender parity is something that is 
global, something that needs to be worked upon globally. And here comes another campaign that the UN Women has worked on extensively, the He for She campaign. How much of a success has it been since it started? It has really helped us to put the issue of men as gender activists on a global stage. The uptake has been quite encouraging. We, however, have not reached the climax of the campaign. We still need to drive the campaign. We still need more men. I want to call on the men in Pakistan to actually go to heforshe.org and register as he for she, but also to become active in their community and local environment and to take action to address issues of gender equality. The campaign is there. We can see what men who stand for gender equality are actually doing and the initiatives that are there. So we're providing examples of what it can be to have positive masculinity. Because we are not against men's masculinity, but the masculinity of men must not be a threat to women. Femininity of women must not be a threat to women. Masculinity and femininity, wonderful combination, but it must all be mutually reinforcing, respectful of each other, and it must be this tapestry of these two genders and any other gender in society that uh, people uh, find uh, themselves in needs to be given its space. It should not be a threat that someone is a different gender from That is yours. so true, that is so true, and I think that a lot of work has been done in this respect and since 2013 when you've joined, you've been even more proactive in, in this sense that being a woman, you understand women globally and you understand what they stand for and you make them understand not only the women, what their rights are, but also the men, how they need to deal with women, which makes me come on the four strategic priorities of the UN women, that women lead, participate, and benefit equally, that women have income security, decent work, and economic autonomy, that all women and girls live a free life from all forms of violence, that women and girls contribute and have greater influence in building sustainable peace and resilience. Since the last five years that you have been part of UN Women, how satisfied have you been on the success of these four strategic priorities? I just want to add first, a congratulatory note to Pakistan about how advanced you are on dealing with the issues of transgender. Uh, this is something to be complimented. You know we have a identity cards for them now. Well, it's, it's, this, is, this is unique mm. in the world. So bravo uh, Pakistan for leading the world uh, in, in, in something that many find very contentious. We will want to make sure that other countries learn from, uh, from Pakistan. But on our core priorities as, as UN women, you never succeed that easily on these issues. So to talk about success uh, uh, and be content would, would not be doing service to the challenges. The, the glasses have filled. We have made progress, but we still have some way to go on issues of income security, as long as the participation of women in the uh, labor force in Pakistan is so low, I cannot talk about success. True. But it's work in progress. That is why we are here and we're talking to different people. But we have to say, we have seen increase of women in the participation of labor force. What we are concerned about is that women tend to be in the underpaid parts of the economy. It also, they are also in, in doing jobs that are not as distant and decent and sustainable. So we have to fix that. But the entry of the women in the labor market is uh, in, increasing. In terms of women living in peace and women living without violence, we are struggling. All right. Yeah, we are struggling mm -hmm. about violence against women, as we have just discussed. True. We are struggling about peace. There are too many wars mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. uh, that women uh, uh, are affected by. And the number of women who are participating in the peace processes is not as high as we can. Right now, I would have loved to see more women in the peace process on Yemen. Mm -hmm. I don't have, we don't have enough That's women true. who are participating. Is the, the uh, issue. Ex exactly, so mm -hmm. we do need to fight very hard for greater participation. And the countries that support peace processes must have the courage of their conviction to push and to call for greater participation of women in these very critical 
peace process because whenever women participate significantly in a peace process, that peace process is lastly to last longer and to have greater impact in society. So it is not doing women a favor by having them participate in, in peace process. It's just to secure the quality of the peace that will come out of that. And when it comes into women's economic empowerment, yes, we are also seeing a more women taking senior position, getting into the diverse sectors of the economy, but not enough. Scale, Omar, scale. We need much more women to be participating uh, in, in, in the economy. Uh, but I really appreciate and compliment everyone who is doing their best to take us forward to the next stage. This is not the time to relax and to hold back. This is the time to push because time is now. If not us, who? That's if, true. If, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. That is so true. Uh, also, speaking of Pakistan, before we go a little bit forward, we've had the privilege of having a woman prime minister twice, Benazir Bhutto Shahid, and we've also had a, a woman uh, speaker of the National Assembly. So we have had women in power, women who've tried to bring the change mm -hmm. as far as the society is concerned. But we don't see that many women leaders in other countries of the world. As part of a very important organization, why do you feel that is so, even in developed countries? Well, it is, it is said that uh, uh, women have not been able to play the role of leader uh, to the extent that the women need uh, women. It is because patriarch is resilient. Uh, it is very difficult for women to break into the corridors uh, of power. They do not get enough uh, support and it is seen as normal to have men as leaders but as uh, uh, in, in a way a deviation to have women as leaders. We need to address this a notion that women do not necessarily belong to the leadership uh, platform, that that leadership platform uh, is for men, because then men become entitled. Uh, a man doesn't have to perform in order to qualify for, for, for leadership. We create conditions where women have to be double and triple capable in order to do a job that an average man is doing. Both men and women are done a disservice mm. by, by that situation. And ma'am, finally, I know you're, uh, you have a lot of important commitments before you leave uh, Pakistan. Firstly, thank you again to, uh, to have joined us. But amongst the different things that your organization, the United Nations Women, focuses on, from leadership and political participation of women, to economic empowerment, to ending violence, to peace and security, to youth, to governance and national planning, to sustainable development agenda, to also HIV and AIDS, and how to prevent that in women, and how to make them understand how they can prevent themselves and the future generations from that. How successful do you feel in the last five years you've been? This, this is a, a global question, mm. not just relegated to Pakistan. The level of our awareness is definitely much higher. The policies, for instance, of, of fighting HIV, AIDS have now recognized that fighting gender inequality is just as important as providing medical uh, and clinical attention. As a result, the partnership that you see between health workers and gender uh, uh, equality activists has become much tighter because the understanding between us is much greater. Women do not become HIV positive in larger numbers, not because their immune system is weaker, because of power relations between men and women, because many of them are, in, are, are infected uh, by men that they, they cannot protect themselves from. Many of them become uh, uh, infected by, by their partners that they cannot force to wear a condom even when they suspect that something is wrong. We have been able to bring this conversation together. And now in most countries, this is seen as not just a medical issue, but it is a social issue for which everybody can play a role. In countries where, for instance, the policies uh, are homophobic, we have a problem in the sense that men who have uh, HIV, uh, AIDS, hide 
the condition because they don't get. Countries that do not address the issue of use of drugs effectively, people who use drugs and are infected by drugs hide the condition. So transparency and discussion together has been heightened by the collaboration uh, that we see. And of course, in schools, we are seeing more and more education about these issues, and the education addresses the special situation of women and girls, and that for us is progress because through that broader knowledge, we are reducing the infection of women and girls. Finally, ma'am, what will be your message to the women, to the girls of Pakistan, and what should we look forward from you as a leader of a very important organization such as UN Women in the coming months and years? I have to congratulate the women of Pakistan for everything that they've done to support the different initiatives, to initiate, in fact, the different and many interventions that have made Pakistan to be what it is today. But also the fact that they are aware that there are more work uh, needs to be done. I want to urge the women to actually grab with both hands the opportunities that are arising as the government, this government is making different pronouncements and policies uh, that are meant to support them. I want to call on the women of Pakistan to focus on implementation. Implementation, 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 because there's many good laws in this country, but implementation is not as good as it needs to be. Let us regroup. Our role as UN Women is to stand with you and to support you in the most practical way to make sure that the implementation of the many policies that women have fought for, have passed in parliament, actually become a lived experience in the lives of many women. What should we look forward from you, ma'am, as leading a very important organization such as UN Women in the coming months and years? Do you have any plans that you'd like to share with us? Our office here uh, is exactly a, an expression of my commitment. My office in the four parts of the, of, of, of the country where we have presence as well as at a, at a, at a federal level, we are here to be your core implementer. You, expect, you can expect us to continue and to do more work with you on work that has to do with women and disability, as we have committed. You can expect us to continue to work with you to do more work, to encourage public sector, to invest and to support women to be stronger and better in entering the, the, uh, the labor market. You can expect us to continue to work with the Women's Caucus in Parliament so that that caucus can be a stronger body and a voice of women in Parliament. You can expect us and me to bring women from other parts of the world as well as facilitate for the women of Pakistan to meet with their counterparts everywhere in the world so that there's this cross fertilization mm -hmm. and learning of experience mm -hmm. so that women of other countries can learn from Pakistan and vice versa. That is our commitment. All right. And on that beautiful commitment and that note, of resilience, that note of telling the women around the world and in Pakistan that you are important, that you are the ones who will bring the next generations forward, that it's because of you that nations will become developed from developing countries. I bid you farewell. Excellency uh, Fumzile Mlambo Tunuka uh, to have uh, joined us, to have given us that rare opportunity to talk about women, to talk about gender in general, and to talk about the issues that plague and how United Nations Women is working to alleviate that. I'll end with a quote from Her Excellency, who said in Thar Parker that when a community decides to tackle a challenge as serious as child marriage head on, millions of girls uh, uh, stand to benefit. All these girls will stand to benefit. These women in Pakistan and around the world will stand to benefit when they stand as one and when they have the backing of organizations such as United Nations Women along with the different governments that cooperate with them. Omar Khalid Bad bids you farewell from this episode, from this very special episode of Diplomatic and We'll be seeing you next week, same time, same channel. Take care of yourselves, Allah Hafiz, and be strong women because you are. And thank you so very much, Excellency, thank to you. have thank given us Thank you so much for having me, Omar.